Welcome back to Selling Your Business with David King. I'm David King, and today I am joined by a guest, Jackie Mazur with Guide My Finances. Thanks for having me, David. I'm happy to be here. Jackie is a financial advisor, and she and I will discuss a few issues related to selling a business and financial planning generally, and they emphasize the need to get a plan in place early, get all the members of your team on board early, and get them involved, get them talking to each other so that you can consummate the American dream, close a sale of your business, and have enough money to retire properly. So Jackie, why don't we start out, you can just tell us a little bit about yourself and your professional background. Sure. So again, my name is Jackie Mazur, and I'm the owner of Guide My Finances, which is a financial planning firm. I'm a certified financial planner, which basically forces me, well, doesn't force me, which makes me a fiduciary, um, which means I'm always acting in the best interest of my clients. So that's a really important thing to always look for if you're looking for a financial planner or somebody in the financial world is make sure they're a fiduciary and or a certified financial planner. My focus is mainly with working with clients in a couple different areas one of which is business owners. I think one of the important things to look for, as you mentioned, David, is making sure that you're set up in advance of even looking at selling your business. I work with business owners as they're getting started to make sure that their business from a financial planning standpoint structured properly, that they have some tax deduction strategies in place, and also that they're positioning themselves for potential sale in the future. I've been in business since 2003, so I've been doing this for over 17 years. And for about three years, I taught as an adjunct professor, I taught financial planning and managerial finance. Um, Financial planning really relates more to the personal side, where managerial finance relates more to the business side. So I have experience working with both, which I've found to be a really great benefit when working with business owners, because very often they're merging their business and their personal into one bucket. What I like to do is show them how to sort of break that apart. How do you use your business to fund your personal goals, but how do you separate those so that your all of your personal income, assets, and plans and goals aren't completely enmeshed with your business. So that's a little bit about me. Again, I'm happy to be here and I've worked with business owners across the board. So lots of different industries, different positions, different times in their careers, and hoping to be a great resource today. It's a perfect combination of skills for the types of of business owners that that I'm serving. Uh, Do you have any particular target client or typical client, both in terms of individuals that you work with and businesses that you work with, business owners, small business owners? Most of my clients that own businesses are privately held companies. So I don't work a lot with you know owners of publicly held companies. So usually family owned businesses, maybe up to five owners is sort of the typical demographic, but I do work with a lot of sole proprietors or, you know, one person or maybe husband and wife owned businesses. The great thing about smaller businesses, especially with less employees, is just how flexible we can get with the planning, specifically as it relates to retirement planning and moving money out of the business through the use of retirement plans. Um, Another area of specialty that I work with a lot of business owners as well as individuals on is real estate planning and how that funds or how that works with your financial plan. My husband and I own a real estate development company. We also own multiple rental properties. And so when clients are evaluating the purchase of properties, whether residential or commercial, I'm able to, one, help them evaluate those purchases from a financial standpoint rather than a sales standpoint. I'm not selling them the property. So I'm able to give them an unbiased opinion about whether it makes sense for their overall plan. Um, But also I'm assisting them with looking at how does that affect their more long-term planning? Is it a benefit to have a commercial property for the retirement plan or is it a disadvantage? Same with rental real estate. So I'm able to lend a lot of advice in that real estate realm without being involved in the actual transaction of the real estate. And then the other area that I really specialize in is retirement planning. For about three years early on, I focused on corporate retirement planning and setting up corporate retirement plans for businesses. And one of the main advantages of that is ERISA protection. So one thing a lot of business owners don't realize is that they can, in a tax deductible fashion, move money out of their business and protect it from creditors 
while keeping it safe and basically in the hands of your personal finances rather than wrapped into the business, but under this umbrella of ERISA protection, which is extremely important. So understanding the intricacies of that is also an area that I'm often advising clients on. Have you worked with business owners to help them implement the right retirement plans so that they can defer the gain on the sale of their business so that they can spread it out over a longer period of time? Is that something you typically try to do when you're brought in on a business? When possible, it really depends on the sale and the objectives and um, how the deal is structured. So when possible, we'll definitely look at that. It really depends on um, the agreements with the seller and the overall price of the business and how the deal is being structured. But it's often something that we can take a look at to see if it's a good fit. The one thing about selling a business, as you probably know, is there's no one way or one solution that fits for everybody. So almost every solution and really one of the things I enjoy most about my work is that every situation is slightly different. And as we're working with a client, it's figuring out what pieces of the puzzle fit for the situation that we're working with at that time. So it's a lot of fun to have different strategies that we can utilize based on the goals and um, just structuring of what's available for any one client. Well, following up on that, um, no one likes to hear, oh boy, you should have called me two weeks ago, two months ago. We could be, avoid what we're in right now. But you're talking to the people who are going to, you know, think of the times that you've been asked to, to assist with someone's finances and the things that they probably should have done different before. If you can think of a few typical mistakes that people make and, and advising people today on things they can do now to make the sale of their business go better or just managing their, you know, their finances generally as business owners. Can you think of the things that you would tell business owners Absolutely. today? Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges that I see with business owners, and this is true for me as well, nobody wants to pay taxes. And so as a result, we tend to use our business as a piggy bank. You're not looking at how can I pull money out of the business and into my personal finances in a way that won't affect the valuation down the line. What a lot of people are doing is spending extra money through the business in order to reduce their tax liability. And that can sort of hurt the business from two different ways. One, all of your assets and income are tied directly to just the business. And so if when you sell the business, or if there's an issue where you're sued or bankrupt or anything like that, everything is tied to the business and could go away very quickly. By separating money out of the business through the use of retirement plans is the typical way we would do it. You can actually add back in those contributions when you're valuing your business for sales since they're discretionary, which allows you to keep your business valuation a little bit higher than if you're just buying or buying, you know, equipment or paying for some of your personal expenses of the business and so on, which will reduce your overall profits of the business and could affect the sale price down the line. So I would say one of the main, I guess, situations that I see business owners getting themselves into is in an attempt to pay less in taxes, they're actually devaluing their company. While there is, there are other ways to pay less in taxes while keeping the value of your company higher. So that is, I would say, number one, the biggest challenge I see or the biggest issue I see with business owners that can be remedied just by education and understanding what the options are and figuring out how do you get money out of the business on a tax deductible fashion without it affecting the valuation. So that would be probably the main piece there. Other, I would say, maybe challenges I see business owners run into in when it comes to selling their business is not knowing how much they need to sell their business for. So a lot of what I'm working with clients on is, well, one, after they sell this business, do they have the intent to keep working? Do they want to roll those profits into another business? If so, then timing may be the most important piece of the sale versus valuation. If you have a business that you've grown to a certain point and you feel like from a timing perspective, now's the best time to get the best value for it, that might be an excellent time to sell. However, if this is the last business you want to run and your retirement and your ability to stop working is dependent upon that sale price, we need to figure out what sort of a net benefit do you need to get from that sale in order to retire comfortably. And I've seen clients sort of jump the gun and sell their business for two or $3 million 
which sounds like a lot, but may not be enough to reach their goals. So just understanding what they need sort of as the end result can be very helpful in determining how, when, and for how much you should sell your business down the line. Two or three million sounds like a lot until you reduce all the expenses of doing the sale and pay multiple tax collectors all that, that you're going to have to pay. It's a good right. reason to be planning it early. And yeah, the, the, the asset protection benefit of those retirement plans is just a wonderful thing that, that people shouldn't underestimate. Here's a simple Absolutely. one for you that I know you can handle. Can you explain for people, business owners who've got a retirement plan, they set up, they may be just a mom and pop, small business, but they have, say, a SEP retirement plan, SEP IRA. Explain the differences with a, a, full, a 401k and the benefits of having a 401k. And if they switch from one to the other, What's the method of doing that? Yeah, so a SEP IRA is an owner or an employer only funded plan. So if you are an owner only company with no employees other than the owners, a SEP IRA can be a great tool. It essentially allows you to put away 25% of your income into a plan and you get to write it off as a business deduction. It's an above the line expense straight from the business's um, income. So you're not paying any taxes, not even payroll taxes on the amount that you're deferring into a SEP IRA. Now, the challenge with that is if you have employees and you put away 25% of your salary, you also have to put away 25% of all of your eligible employees' salaries as well which can be extremely expensive if you have you know, a variety of employees or even one highly paid employee. So a SEP IRA can be a useful tool if you have some lower paid employees or if you're an owner only company who wants to put away you know, a good chunk of money as a business deduction. Um, a 401k plan works a little bit different. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is you can set up a 401k plan for an owner only company and do it very inexpensively. There are basically expedited plan documents you can use for that are much less expensive than if you have employees to set up a 401k plan if you're a sole owner or husband and wife, or even if you're partners, but you have no employees. Um, the difference with a 401k plan is is that one, you can make both employee and employer contribution. Now, here's the benefit of that. If you are paying, let's say you're on payroll and you're paying yourself $100,000 per year, with the SEP IRA, you can put away $25,000 as a tax deductible expense. If you have a 401k plan and you make that same $100,000, you can still put away that $25,000 as a business expense, but you can also put away $19,500 as the employee, all tax deductible. So you have a lot higher contribution limits with the 401k plan than you have with the SEP IRA. Also, if you have employees, you can offer the option for your employees to save money in the 401k plan out of their paychecks. And very often you will want to make a contribution as the employer, but as long as you're putting away about 3% of each employee's salaries, um, that's kind of the minimum that you want to plan for, which is usually very attainable. Um, and you can contribute up to $53,000 for yourself as long as you put a small amount into each of your employees' plans. And that's a much larger calculation that I can't explain right now because it really depends on the age and, and income and so on of the different employees. But very often you're able to put away 65 to 80% of that total contribution into your own account or into the owner's accounts. And it's costing you you know, only 20 to 40% of the contribution to your employees, which truthfully you would have paid in taxes anyway. So it's a great way to recruit, retain, and reward your employees. Um, one of the other key benefits is that in order for a plan to be protected by ERISA, you do have to have an employee other than yourself in the plan. So the 401k plan, if you have employees, is ERISA protected. The SEP IRA, if you have employees, is ERISA protected. But if it's owner only, there is a little bit of a gray area there as to whether it is or isn't fully protected um, through ERISA. Wonderful. And as everybody can tell, Jackie is a complete crackerjack when it comes to retirement <laughs> plans and can help. Help small business owners pick the right plan and get them in place. And if this sounds like it's unrelated to selling a business, you know, what my retirement planning, it's not because early planning is everything. And if you don't 
put aside money, salt away money in, in the, the markets or more, you know, liquid accounts throughout the years. You're gambling your entire retirement on the successful sale of your business. Oh, I, I put it back into the company. I put it back into the company. And you hear that, you know, I understand that 80 of small business owners, they have an average of 85% of their net worth tied up in the company. And, you know, we can't ignore the markets, especially in times like this, the, the broader markets. You and I have been out there as, as service providers independently through the, the real estate crash, the Wall Street crash of 2008, and now we're seeing just a complete about face of the economy through the current crisis, the current COVID recession, um, it, you know, seeing this sort of wreckage out there and seeing seeing it happen before, both, you know, for, for very different reasons, um, what sorts of mistakes did you see people make maybe getting in a little bit too deep or being too concentrated in one area? If you can think back to what you saw before and what the problems that people are coming to you today. Can you think of a yeah. few things that you mistakes oh, absolutely. that you see? I think there's, I would say one of the biggest ones is just not having enough cash in the accounts to cover a few months worth of expenses. Um, as I, I work with a lot of successful businesses who have been able to completely weather this COVID storm and have had little, very little effect. Granted, they're their overall sales may have come down a little bit, but in the scheme of things, they've come through this somewhat unweathered. Um, I think the businesses that are having the more difficult time are those that don't have any retained earnings in the business to cover future expenses or that are too highly leveraged. And so depending on the business, depending on the cash flow, and depending on what the expenses are of the business, I would highly recommend taking a look at your balance sheet and making sure that as you move forward, that you look to have, you know, at least two months worth of payroll in your accounts and enough money to sustain your business for maybe two to three months, the same way that we say personally, you should have six months worth of living expenses in an account. Maybe you don't need quite six months in your business account, but you may want to have two to three months worth of expenses saved up in your business account so that if there is a decline in sales, that you have the funds, you have the resources to stay afloat and to stay in business. Um, I think one of the other things that COVID and the situation in my we're in right now has taught a lot of business owners is that having multiple streams of income or at least being able to pivot quickly can be very important. Are there ways to have online sales as well as in-person sales? Or is there some sort of virtual product that you can offer in addition to your more traditional product? That doesn't fit for everybody, but just having starting to brainstorm and look at what ideas could you integrate into your business moving forward to make it more valuable and to really stay current with how technologies are evolving. Because if we're not evolving with those technologies and with the world, your business could be a thing of the past. And I've seen that happen for clients where they're the leading provider of printing services. And now so little is being printed on actual paper that their businesses are becoming almost obsolete. So figuring out how can you, instead of having it be print, you know, actual hard copy, but how can you maybe create a similar product that's virtual or that can be delivered electronically. So always looking for how can you keep your business relevant, I would say is a really big, a big piece. And that maybe has less to do with me and you, but it's just something that I've seen clients challenged with recently. Because we yeah. can see people who are, have, challenges that come along that turn into financial challenges that, that may arise for any number of reasons, health or operations of their business. But it's it's getting that cushion, getting that buffer. Um, I can remember a, a quote from a, a corporate finance professor in law school that the stock market only goes one direction, the way it's going right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Nobody> <laughs> That's a great one. <laughs> Nobody. Yeah. And another CFO of a company back when I was an auditor that, that explained, we're conservative. If there's going to be any surprises, they're going to be good surprises. Well, that's so, what you hope, right? Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. And small business owners have got their head down 24 hours a day. They work eight days a week. They break their backs. They take home. Often they, they take home very little. They put it all back into the company. You know, the, the salt of the earth people out there. Um, yeah. And I re respect all for what they do out there. And it is, you know, maybe there's just not enough hours in the day or part of it's the personality type that they, they've got to control what's going on at their business. But it, it, it would be good if it, a little bit more often they could put their head up and get a second opinion and, and spot 
the weaknesses in their financials. You, you don't get advice from your CPA often unless you ask for it. Um, right. And a lot of CPAs don't feel like, you know, that's why the people come to them. They come to me for tax returns and that sort of thing. If you wanted, you know, my opinion about what you should do, I can give it to you. But do you, do you see people that just haven't been asking for advice and it's high time that they just finally come in and, and get someone to advise them on their balance sheet or their, how they're running? Absolutely. And I would say that I think one of the things that a lot of people overlook is how much value somebody like you or I could have in that same area. Area. We're working with so many clients in so many industries and have experience working with business owners. And so the more business owners you can talk to, or the person who's worked with the most business owners that you can talk to is going to have a lot of valuable information for you. So I would, I would lean on not just your CPA, but your attorney and your financial planner and the other trusted advisors in your group to say, look, here's my business. What do you think? Are there anything that you've seen with other clients? clients that could be a resource or information for me. And I know I'm always happy to share, of course, keeping my client's confidentiality in mind, but sharing best practices or ideas or things that have worked or things that haven't worked, which is sometimes even more important than the things that have worked to give clients some guidance and some information about where to go from there. I will say that having a good CPA and good bookkeeping is extremely important. If you don't understand what your accounting professionals are doing and they aren't explaining it to you clearly, you might want to hire somebody else because not only do they need to have an idea of what's going on, you need to understand what's going on as it relates to those two areas because we can't plan around your taxes and you can't understand your cash flow, your available resources, et cetera, if you don't have a clear understanding of what your financials look like. So make sure that you have a really good bookkeeper and a great CPA who are not only just doing your taxes and managing your books, but are meeting with you at least quarterly to walk you through how things are coming along. Have you had any major changes either in an up or downward trend? Because those trends can be really important in understanding how you should continue to move your business down one direction or maybe stopping moving it in one direction. Right. So always important to have that information and to lean on the people who you know have have experience and resources for you. And a, a good book, bookkeeper is worth their weight in gold. If a business doesn't keep good accounting and maintain good accounting, well, then you're going to have to clean it up before you sell because business right. businesses just will not sell uh, and unless and until they've got reliable numbers um, for the buyer. And a lot of times, if the numbers aren't good, um, then the deal will just simply fall apart altogether. So it's simply not worth it to cut corners with accounting and with tax advice. Right. I don't know if it's just anecdotal or I've heard a survey about it, but uh, most trusted advisor for most small business owners is their CPA. I, and I, I believe it. Yeah. yeah. So they usually find out first about things that are going to happen. If the company is going to mm -hmm. sell somewhere up the road or, or what their long-term plans are. A lot of times with legal services, people don't want to call up their attorney and ask for advice because they're afraid of getting a bill for their time. And it would be just so much cheaper to ask before you go out and make that mistake and then have to call later and have to spend more time and more money on things. Is it the same way with being a financial advisor that if people had just come to you sooner that it would be less work? to get them on the, the right track. Oh, absolutely. I think the more time you have on your side, the better planning and the better strategy you can put in place. And I would say that's true with everybody, with, with all of your professionals. If, mm -hmm. if you have a five to 10 year timeline for when you'd like to exit your business, you should be engaging your attorney to figure out what do you need to position now to make sure that you're going to be more successful down the line. And that has to do with everything from business structure, as I'm sure that you can talk to ownership, et cetera. So there's a lot of pieces that need to be put in place from the beginning, need to be reviewed as you're progressing, and then need to be solidified as you get closer to that exit plan. And financial planning is one of those. Absolutely. You know, as we were just talking about with the accounting and with the bookkeeping, making sure that your expenses are categorized properly can even be a huge determinant of how much your business is worth because certain expenses get added back for valuation where others don't and are considered hard expenses. And if you're categorizing something that could be added back to that to the valuation as a non-add back line item, that's going to hurt the valuation in the long run. Now, most financial planners aren't going to work with you that deeply on your balance sheet, but I'll tell you, I review my clients' taxes and their P&Ls on an annual basis, or sometimes more frequently, depending on the clients, just to make sure that 
there's nothing that we can do from a financial planning perspective to save them money on taxes and also to look for anything that seems out of place. Just this year, I was able to identify that a, both the bookkeeper and the CPA for one of my business clients missed had a retirement contribution categorized as something totally different. And as a result, they weren't getting the right tax deduction and weren't able to add that back if they needed to in the, down the line. And it just had to do with how the financial planning or how the accounting software was categorizing it. And both the bookkeeper and the CPA didn't catch it. So just having an extra set of eyes and making sure that that your advisors who know what you're doing and what's going on are also getting eyes on your books can be an added value. But there's, I, I would say that there's an unlimited amount of benefits when it comes to working with a financial advisor, um, not just because I am one, but you know, as I was mentioning, even with real estate, understanding should you buy a, a building? Now your CPA is going to come into that and tell you about from a tax perspective, but what about from an expense and just overall financial planning perspective? When you're making big purchase decisions, you should be engaging multiple advisors with different specialties to get the different perspectives and really to have somebody devil's advocating for you not just for your business absolutely or for themselves right right earlier you mentioned health and as we're talking about things that business owners run into i think a really important thing to make sure that business owners have in place earlier on is a strategy around if there's a health event or if there's a divorce i'm also a certified divorce financial analyst which is a designation that allows me to help both individuals and business owners when navigating divorce. And one of the things that we see is that if proper agreements are not in place, especially when there's multiple owners, if and there's a health event or if a divorce takes place, that it can become just a huge drag on the business. And that in some cases it can sink the business or create a cash flow issue that can't continue to support, you know, allows the business to no longer be solvent. So Definitely making sure that you have plans in place for those two potential events is as important as anything else. Absolutely. And if there is an event like a death or a divorce or a disability dispute between the owners that, that triggers an interest in selling, well, you can get the business sold for a fire sale right. price. You're not, right. I mean, because the buyer knows you've got to get it off your hands. The clock is running here. There's going to be problems, or at least they expect, expect there's going to be. You got to give yourself a couple of runs up the ramp here to get it sold. Expect it's going to take a couple of times and you've got to reserve the ability to walk away from a deal. When you have a good book of clients that are women and women business owners, I'm assuming. I do. Yeah. I think just as a function of being a woman, I, I attract women business owners and just women in general. I work with a lot of men as well, but I, it is a big part of my practice. Do you find differences in the philosophy, the financial management of women or, or women business owners? Are they, would you say that they tend to be more conservative than men? Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's what I would. I, I hate to generalize because I would say that there's always exceptions to the rule. However, based on my experience, I have found that that women business owners in general like to have a plan. So from day one, they're reaching out to me saying, I'm starting a business. I want to have a plan. Help me figure out the plan. Where I've found with the male counterparts, they might get further down the line before they are looking to have that plan in place. Now, again, that's not everybody. I have a lot of, you know, male business owner clients who reach out to me from the get go, but kind of generalizing. Also conservatism, for sure. Um, women tend to be stronger savers and want to have more retained earnings, more tend to be a little bit less aggressive with their tax planning and want to do things a little bit more by the book and in a more conservative fashion and also want more conservative projections. They're not as aggressive with their prog projections of how they think the business is going to go. They want to look at a more worst case scenario versus a best case scenario to plan with. So it definitely is a different difference, uh, or at least a, a general difference that I see from my male and female business owners. I try to get both of them to see something in the middle. So when my clients are overly conservative, I will certainly run projections based on that over conservative aspect, but I want to show them what's also likely possible. And with some of my male business owners,
our clients who are maybe projecting at growth rates that are amazing and I hope that they can reach them, but I also want to give them maybe a scaled back version of what's possible just to be, I hate to say realistic because I want that higher goal to be realistic, but just so that we have sort of a high end and a low end of what they can expect and what they can be looking for and with a hope that they're going to continue to reach that high end, but at least we're planning for two different scenarios. It's so true. I mean, there's the stereotype of the country club wife and with the credit card that has no concept of the value of money. And maybe there's the one in the million that are out there that are like that. The women who I work with who are business owners, I find the exact same thing. They seem to be more conservative about financial issues and about legal issues as well. They ask ahead of time. They don't want to make a mistake and come back and say, hey, what do we do to fix this? It's more often Mm -hmm. we're planning to do something, advise us. And that's that's the way to use your lawyers so that they don't become expensive. And I've got to tell you, I, of my clients, and this might just be a function again of being a woman and working with maybe more women than most financial planners. But I would say over half of my clients when working with, well, the the wife is the primary breadwinner. And when husband and wife are running the business together, although there's different roles, the finances are tending to be on the wife's plate. (laughs) So I think that a lot of those stereotypes that have maybe been true previously have completely been thrown out the window today. And women are taking a much more sort of strong role in the financial management of not only the business finances, but also the personal finances. And I think that that's a function of being more conservative and not wanting necessarily their husbands or the male counterpart to be overly aggressive with their investments and just wanting to know what's going on and be sure that everything's being managed, you know, appropriately and and in a way that they're comfortable with. Right now, day in, day out. Um, You're working with people and you're probably working with people that are in a fairly frantic state right now. What what types of things are are taking a lot of your time, you know, trying to get government money, filling out a length of forms and complying with these regs and that regs that nobody's ever seen before? It seems like there's a lot of that going on, that that's kind of the blood coming into the economy these days and everybody is having to do a heck of a lot of work to comply with all these new program. Absolutely. And I think it's changed. So when this crisis first hit, I, I was dealing with just a lot of fear with my clients around their investments, which at the time was, you know, warranted. The market was dropping very quickly and there was a lot of fear around that. It was about the unknown and whether their businesses would continue to bring in any money or what sort of reduction in revenues they would see. And so it was really just being a support system for my clients and explaining what our expectations were, reminding them of our investment philosophy and why we have the strategy that we have and that we've been planning for a recession for four years because we've been saying it's coming and that everything is set up from an investment standpoint, the way that it should be going into a recession. From a business perspective, it was figuring out, okay, let's talk about it. And I'm not a business coach, but I, I tend to just by being so ingrained and just an integral part in discussing finances, that's a very personal area of someone's life. And so as a result, clients tend to talk to me about a lot of other areas of their life and, and their business that don't, that aren't just specifically related to their finances. So it was really helping them through, okay, what's the plan? What are we going to do over the next three to six months if things don't recover? What's the plan for making sure you have enough money to support both your personal and your business finances and really just getting strategic? And then now, of course, or at least a couple of weeks ago, it was helping clients determine how do they get PPP funds? Um, how much in PPP funds should they receive? How do they make sure it's all forgiven? What steps do they need to take? And also with the economic injury disaster loans that are now being starting to really come through, should they take those loans that are at you know, a really advantageous interest rate and don't have to be paid back for 30 years. And what could that money be used for in order to help elevate their company and get them through this time? So it is really a moving target, but I do my best to stay as informed as possible and what the different government programs are, how to best take advantage of them. And I'll tell you, I have a couple of clients that didn't even consider taking a PPP loan. And after talking to them and understanding their business and their cash flow and their employee situation, I encourage them 
them to apply. And it was the difference between keeping them in business and not draining their savings over the next two months and or not, because some of them didn't even think that they would qualify. But after looking at everything and seeing, okay, you have some reserves, but if you don't take this money, your reserves will be gone and then what? So it's really just educating and encouraging clients to take advantage of some of these programs to keep their businesses moving along and even to potentially grow their businesses during this time. We, we kind of brushed aside this, touched upon it uh, lightly. We've, we've mentioned, you know, couples that own businesses, and we've talked generally about the subject of the financial strain of a divorce and rebounding mm-hmm. from that or having a good plan. Have you had the occurrence of working with a couple going through a divorce that owns a business together? Um, obviously, we won't go into specifics about any of them, right. but I personally have several times, uh, you know, professionals who own businesses together or mom and pop type businesses, and they were great business partners back when they were married. But of course, it becomes, or at least in the cases I've seen, it becomes very difficult to continue to operate the business together. Yeah, of course. I would say I've had both. I've had business owners who have divorced who are able to maintain a business relationship moving forward. And they also have kids together. So they're able to just sort of separate the marriage from the business and the child, you know, and the co-parenting. And that's really the best position you can be in. The challenge with selling the business to one spouse or the other is that, well, a couple things. One, having the assets elsewhere to offset the valuation of half that business and whether that even makes sense to do because if all the income is tied to the business, whomever ends up with the business is probably still going to have to pay support even though they got the value of the business while the other person got the value of the, of the house or the value of the investment accounts or so on. So it definitely is a challenging situation where we have to look at the value of the business, the income coming from the business. If there's a buyout scenario, does the spouse that's being buyed out have the ability to replace the income that they were otherwise making? Or is the person who buys the business at somewhat of a disadvantage because they're getting the asset, but they're still paying support from the income being generated to the other spouse? I mean, it can get so complicated. (laughs) I hate to say we have to evaluate it on a case-to-case basis because that sounds a little bit like a cop-out, but you really do because part of it comes down to whether the husband and wife are able to work together even for a period of time, amicable way, or if they're not at all. And that from just the get-go is going to basically create the path for what's next. And if they are able to work together, how long do they think they can do that? And based on that information, then what steps need to be put in place and so on. So, I mean, divorce in general is complicates a lot around finances. And although none of us want to think about ever getting divorced, it's something that I don't want to say I encourage clients to think about because if it's not even on their mind. I don't want to encourage them to think about divorce, but you certainly have to think about, okay, if this were to happen, what would we do? Do we have the agreements in place to say how the business would be valued for a buyout or what, how much time we would have to sell the business in this sort of a situation? And I would say it's even more so an issue when there's other partners involved, because if it's just the husband and wife, whether the agreement is ideal really the only two people being affected by it are the two people making the decision. When there's a spouse involved in business ownership and they're partnered with somebody else, the spouse is entitled to 50% of their half of the company. That Now there's other people involved and you almost need to do more planning around what would happen if either partner got a divorce. Because in, in California, at least it's a community property state, unless there's some sort of a prenup in place saying the business is separate property, either spouse is entitled to half of the partner's half of that business. And that can get very complicated and affect more than just the two parties in the divorce. It's necessary or the benefits of it, I, I think to me, to you and I are, it's something that if you can sort out a plan, it's certainly a better time to do it before two people are hostile to each other. And it's certainly better to have a, a plan for what you're going to do before you hit the need to, to do it, you know, and rather Absolutely. than be, you know, operating under the duress of the situation. And it's sensitive. Of course, nobody likes to sit down with their spouse and, and you know, contemplate what if something goes wrong in this marriage. But selling your business is is somewhat similar, even though it sounds like a delightful event. It's not something most small business owners like to talk about, especially, you know, they they wouldn't want to sit down at the office with their CFO and talk about, well, you know, if I sell within the next couple of years, that's not a cat you can let out of the bag. 
Um, right. your, your employees can't know about it. Your competitors can't know. Your customers can't know. It's something that you keep under wraps until the last possible minute. So both of these are something that you are very sensitive and people were reluctant to put on the table, but they're absolutely necessary to put on the table. One, to get the best, you know, the most you can out of it with selling a business, start planning early, you know, and if it, discreetly with your advisors. And then with the divorce, mitigate the harm here, get a plan in place. It's not going to come out roses, but try to, to do it in a way that you don't cause yourself too much harm. If, uh, if you had to give advice right now to small business owners generally, the areas to look at, you, you know, you mentioned accounting, bookkeeping, their financial planning, getting retirement plans, general areas that you would advise people to focus upon. One more thing specifically, uh, well, there's probably a lot, but the one thing that pops straight into my head is understanding your cash flow. I know I, most of my clients are not on a budget, so I hate to say budget because a lot of people are making enough money that they're not paying attention to how much they're spending in any one category. But I think that one of the things people underestimate is how, what their expenses will be if they no longer have the business. And so, for instance, if their car is being paid for through the business because it's a business expense, if their cell phone is being paid through the business because they use their cell phone for business. And so these are legitimate business expenses, but they're things that if you don't have a business are now coming from your personal income and maybe something that you've never thought about as an expense or that you didn't think about was going to be an expense in the future. So one of the things I always sort of make my clients do when they become clients is, again, it's not a budget. I'm not saying you have to stick to what we've said you're expenses are, but list what your expenses are, both on a personal standpoint. And maybe let's look at your business tax returns and see what items are you deducting that are going to be personal expenses once you no longer have your business. Because whenever we're doing long-term planning, we need to understand how much you're spending every year. And if what a lot of clients will say is, oh, I spend about seven grand a month or 10 grand a month on my house and my credit card combined. And really that's most of my expenses. But they forget about the other $10,000 a month that's coming out of their business and travel and cars and phones, et cetera. And so if we plan their retirement strategy on only needing $10,000 a month, but really they need 20, that's a huge difference. It's going to really affect their ability to retire if they're spending twice as much as they thought, or even 50% more than they thought, or 20% more than they thought. We really need to have a clear picture of what's going out. And so one of the things I always encourage clients to do is to put together a list of what you're spending every month so that so that you have a clear picture of it. And I can't tell you, every time a client does it, they're a little bit like, mm, I don't want to do this when we first start. But once they do it, I've never had a client disappointed that they've gone through the, the exercise. And more so than not, clients tell me, this was a huge eye-opening experience to show me just exactly how much I'm spending where. And it's made me want to pay more attention. And that in itself can be a huge just step in making sure that you're financially you know, prepared both today and in the future. Super. That's, that's great advice. That's great advice. And I, I don't know if you have a resource on your podcast for links, but I have a great budgeting template or cash flow sure. template that I can provide to you if you'd like. Please go um, ahead. People and tell can it. just download and can fill in on their own. Just as Again, as a great free resource. Okay. Well, I can put that out there. Well, again, I thank Jackie so much, Jackie. I really enjoyed speaking with you this morning. For anyone who doesn't know Jackie, she's an absolutely delightful person to know and a very, very sharp professional. She loves her work, cares about the people she works with. She is an absolute angel. I really love Jackie. Tell um, me more. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Jackie's firm, Guide My Finances, is in Carlsbad, California. And the website is guidemyfinances.com. That that's it. Okay. Easy. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And that's all today for selling your business with David King. Take care.